<laughs> Funny enough, uh, to just a showcase for this recording, because I married two different sections of things together with my excellent editing skills, but I forgot I had like six or seven videos already lined up before other stuff, so I'll also release these as well. So, enjoy! Alright, so there's not too much, like, lit RPG stuff I usually get into, mainly because, th and again, this is just my opinion, a lot of lit RPG has, um, how does, well, there's no really delicate way to say it, gamma male protagonists, and, um, yeah, that's not my cup of tea, just to, to say the least. Which, um, God, that one show where everybody's saying it's like the father of Isaki or something. Yeah, where, you know, it was the, the, the loser guy in his 30s that when he gets reborn, you know, he's reborn in a fantasy land where he can try to have a, a second go at things. Uh, yeah, that that's what I see as kind of like a, the gamma male right there, where it's, you know, he was such a, a downtrodden big old loser in his former life that this was the only way he could really get a second chance. Again, that's just my setup and my outlook on things. Me as a reader, I am not interested in the Gamma Male. Uh, so, to carry on, uh, CJ, with his uh, particular series, does not have a Gamma Male. In fact, his guy is kind of like a, kind of more of a blue collar, I would say, kind of guy, you know, fixes and repairs things, that sort of thing, works with his hands. He makes him he makes him, you know, his his regular life seem fairly average. He lives comfortably, but you know, he but he's not a shut in. He he's not a hermit and he's fairly sociable, which is vital, I think, for uh, you know, lit RPG stuff. Like I like seeing protagonists that are a little bit more proactive, especially on the guy side. I like seeing much more, you know, don't don't have the guys react as much. Have them, like, you know, stride out and go out and, you know, slay the dragon, shoot the bad guys, you know, that sort of thing. Because, again, uh, I expect different things from male and female protagonists. That's just the way it is, you know. Um... So here we go. For like I said in my review for Twilight Templar, yes, it does have like a little bit of a harem aspect, um, and it does have uh, you know a darker aspect that I don't normally go into. But he remembers to like not make everything, you know. Uh, it doesn't go berserk level. Let, let's just say. Let me just put it that way. Um, it actually has a little bit of a a space fantasy or science fiction kind of bent to it you, that you'll see near the end of the book which I find highly interesting again like uh, there's just certain little things that automatically get my interest um, I do find it funny that he finds a talking sword you know sentient sword <laughs> or sapient sword I guess however cause I, cause I still remember I still remember Deacon Flynn just telling me no you don't use that word that word is not what you think it means you have to use you have to use sapient. It's like, okay. So that's what I'm doing. You have to use the word sapient. So this sword, basically, it, it, he, he does start off at basic rock bottom. Um, so the eternal journey. Uh, it does have the basic setup of, yes, uh, they get whisked away to an MMO setting. But unlike the, you know, some of the other ones, there is a for those of you who get your attention from, oh no, is the character going to die? Well, every time one of these characters dies, like in terms of if you're from our world into this one, uh, the more you die, the more memories you lose of where you formerly came from. And it looks like, based on what's popping up in this book, that other people from other time periods across our Earth and from the past to the distant future have been sucked up into this world and they bring certain things with them like certain kinds of knowledge uh, and even from s something as simple as cooking to architecture to even a little bit of tech but not in the way you expect like um it looks like there's a little bit of a 
a cap on that. Like you're, they're not shooting each other with laser guns, even if you are from a era of human history that has laser guns everywhere. <laughs> so you know, you can't go wrong with that. I don't think. It, and you know, honestly, at this point, I've read enough of C.J. Carilla's stuff to know that he'll deliver on a story that I'd be at least pretty interested in. Uh, some wheelhouses will interest me more than others, but he did such a good job with New Olympus Saga that I pretty much you know, followed him around since then to see what else he he basically gets into. And even, and again, even though it does have some harem aspects, he doesn't make it to where, because in a lot of gamma male fantasies, all the girls pay attention to the protagonist solely to the exclusion of everyone else. They'll run over, run roughshod over each other to gain senpai's attention, you know, that sort of thing. But no, here, it's, uh, he's basically, um... He does he does favor some a little bit more than others based on what I can see, but uh, each of the each of the women have their own modus operandi and they have their own reason for traveling with him, rather than just like oh please senpai notice me you know. Again, I, uh, yeah, and I would feel just the same because it also comes rolling out of the Anita Blake shit. If you have a female character where all the guys are simping for her, and she's basically the gamma female, even though there's not really... Females have... We have a different kind of, like, hierarchy set up, I guess you could say, but the, the, the idea is the same. It's like where she's like a vacuum, Sue, that's that's just sucking in all the life and, and personality from all the guy characters around her. Yeah, I don't find that appealing either. In fact, um, launch Anita Blake into the sun, let all the books burn. Thank you. Uh, but to carry back on with uh, Twilight Templar, I I like the fact that he does balance, you know, setting up this world versus not having endless pages of stats pop up all the time. Because I know that's how a lot of lit RPG books pad out their, their length to like six, seven hundred pages, maybe sometimes eight hundred pages. Because they're constantly, every time the character levels up, they're, this whole entire spreadsheet of statistics is it's like, oh my goodness. Um, so he kind of controls that aspect in, in showing, like, okay, the character did level up, but where is his skills, what, what skills are going into where, and how does that mechanic work? But he doesn't let it drag the story down. A lot of lit RPG, it's like everything comes to a screeching halt when they, when they pop up the character sheets. And I'm like, nah, I don't need to know every statistical upgrade all the time. So, you know, th that is definitely another thing in its favor. Um, the way he interacts with the world is pretty interesting. Uh, he w he treats the, in air quote, the NPCs there with r the same respect he'd give other people. And you can kind of tell that's a lot different from this overall uh, guild of modern people that are situated in one of the major cities. And they basically see the NPCs as just that, like, oh, hey, give me money, give me quest, whatever. They treat them like garbage. And in later books, you know, that stuff really begins to come back and bite them in the ass. So while it ends up helping Hawk a bit, um, because you, you begin to realize, like, hmm, there's a lot more going on here, and especially once you see a little bit more of the sci-fi bent going in. It's like, oh... Oh my. So, that's about it for now, everybody. I'd say if you're looking for an interesting lit RPG series that isn't bogged down with, you know, what a majority of them are, which is like Monster Girl Harem with Gamma Male Guy, I would say give the Twilight Templar a try. Have a good evening.